Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. This is your host, Mongo Slate. Today, we're going to be talking about the final A&E biography, which put the focus on WrestleMania 1. And to be quite honest, this is a top-tier biography on WrestleMania. It They clearly put some effort into this, and there was a lot of people involved. I loved the cast of Talking Heads from... Keith Lee Greenberg, um, Dave Wolf, the guys behind MTV, the VJs, Wendy Richter was here, Hulk Hogan was here. It was, it's phenomenal. They talked to everybody except Vince. You know, if it wasn't for, you know, the whole scandals stuff, I think Vince would have been able to add so much to this biography. Like, everybody talks so much about WrestleMania and what it means. Uh, and, Vince is one of the few people, like, he doesn't talk a lot about his things that he was successful with. Vince or Linda should have been involved with this biography. That's the thing that I feel is missing. Yes, we got to talk to all the nine McMahons and all of the other people that was involved with WrestleMania 1. But you still needed, I think we needed Vince and Linda. We needed their perspectives in this biography and we didn't get it. So as usual, it wasn't perfect, but it actually was pretty good. I did do a little bit of extra reading, so um, I'll be be able to bring that in. But it's it's not much. I didn't do. I didn't have time to do a lot. So uh, let's talk about it. So WrestleMania one, the seed of WrestleMania. What what they did is they came up with. uh, They explained to the good people the territory system, which is you know the right thing to do. They started with the WWWF was the largest territory. Vince buys the territory from his father. Uh, Steve Taylor, the photographer for the WWF magazine, um, he goes to an AWA show and slips Hulk Hogan, Vince McMahon's phone number. This would be Vince Jr. Uh, uh, Hulk Hogan is sort of unhappy in the AWA. They didn't explain why he was unhappy. I will explain why. <laughs> uh, Vern Gagne and Hulk Hogan were having a lot of problems. Um, some of those problems were creative in terms of Hogan was not being given the title in AWA. Vern Gagne didn't want to make Hulk Hogan the champion. He instead wanted Hulk Hogan to basically chase perpetually forever uh, Nick Bockwinkle, who was at this point in his, I think he's in his 50s at this point. And um, he didn't want Hogan to actually be the champion because Hogan didn't have uh, an amateur background. And um, so he didn't really see it. That's kind of how old promoters thought. If you didn't have an amateur background, they were kind of leery of giving you the belt. But it was also financials. Um, Hulk Hogan was starting to sell a lot of merchandise, make a lot of money. And Vern Gagne wanted a large cut of what, what Hulk Hogan was making. So basically, Vince gave him a better deal. Um, Hulk Hogan was leery about coming to the WWF because he had gotten into it with Vince McMahon Sr. over Rocky III. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. didn't want Hulk Hogan to do Rocky III, and Hogan wanted to do it. It was the right decision for Hogan to go and do it, and because it made him extremely popular. And that's actually part of the reason why there was even a Hulkamania in the first place because of Rocky III. And he wasn't even in that movie very long. That shows you how, you know... You had a wrestler who was in, who was, who knows Sylvester Stallone and all that kind of stuff. So that was kind of, it's kind of special. So when Steve Taylor pops up and he gives Hulk Hogan this uh, phone number, Hulk go, calls Vince Jr. and they start to make a deal. So the biography, they tell the story of how Bob Backlund, good athletic guy, typical amateur wrestler, but not the, the guy that Vince Jr. wants to be his top guy. Bob Backlund is howdy doody. You know, that's, he's a white meat baby face. You know, Bob Backlund wasn't, he wasn't a super draw either. Bob Backlund was the kind of guy who was, you built a team around him. He wasn't your top, he's not Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's not Hulk Hogan. He's Bret Hart, you know. Bret Hart probably drew more than Bob Backlund. But you build a team around him. So Jimmy Snuka, Don Morocco, those guys really helped uh, the territory while Bob Backlund was the champion. So Vince Jr. wants to get rid of Bob Backlund. And um, they create, of course, this scenario with the Iron Sheik um, because WWF is not above playing into political politics. Um, the Iron Sheik, they come off the uh, 
the oil situation in the seventies. Everybody's very angry at the at the Middle Easterners, but you're also dealing with um, the hostage crisis in Iran at the time. So <clears throat> the Iron Sheik is white hot. There, there's Arab characters popping up all over the territories too. There's several in like Texas, and there's several in other southern territories that are popping up. Um, oil, they, they're all oil millionaires too, by the way. So they was really stereotyping Arabs at the time. <laughs> it was going hard on the Arabs. <laughs> Uh, so basically, Hulk Hogan wins the title. Of course, the birth of Hulkamania. Uh, Hulk Hogan is a superhero for the children, but he's also a guy who was into rock music because, again, Hulk Hogan wanted he plays the guitar, you know, and he, of course, lies about how he was going to play in this band or that band or whatever. But this was he basically appealed to the right demographic. You know, he's an American hero who appeals to the right demographic. He's larger than life. Hulkamania is running wild. So then they talk about some of the business aspects like cable TV. Cable TV becomes a big deal. There's real, there's not a lot of cable TV providers, but at the, around the time of the first WrestleMania, Vince is on cable and on two different networks. He's on WTBS, which is Ted Turner's network, and he's on the USA network, which is at the time, I don't think it was owned by NBC at the time. So he has two different cable subs, um, networks that to which he's pumping out his shows. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about Black Saturday, so what they call Black Saturday is when Vince McMahon and the WWF took over the Georgia Championship Wrestling time slot in Atlanta. So what happens is Vince McMahon goes into business with Ted Turner. They make a deal. They kick off uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling. They kick them off. So now Vince McMahon owns the time slot that is called World Championship Wrestling. Uh, this was uh, in June of 1984. Um, but this is this is the origin of Vince's beef with Ted Turner. This is a really ugly situation. As Vince, uh, the part of the deal with Ted Turner is Vince will have to record his shows in Atlanta in WTBS studios in order to, you know, get the shows out. Vince doesn't want to do that because he has a massive roster. So what he chooses to do is basically tape all the shows in different venues from Philadelphia and Boston and Madison Square Garden or whatever and send these tapes to WTBS for them to show in this time slot. Now, if you listen to Jim Cornette, only thing you'll hear is, oh, the the, the ratings went down and the people hated it. It's like, that's not really why you know, Ted Turner took it off. Vince violated quite a few um, things when it comes to the contract. He refused to tape in Atlanta. Uh, that was one, That was a big one. So he, but this was the bigger one. Um, like I just said, Vince McMahon had a deal with USA Network, which is a, which is a competitor to WTBS. So Ted Turner wants Vince to sign an exclusive contract, basically get off of USA. Vince refuses. He's like, well, I got two networks. Why should I? Why should I have to only have one? So Ted Turner, in his infinite wisdom, he goes to Bill Watts and he gives a time slot to Mid South Wrestling. So now he's like, well, you want to double dip. I'm a double dip. I'm going to help one of your competitors. So Vince and Ted Turner are, are there at loggerheads about this thing. Uh, Vince is in breach of contract from not uh, doing the, uh, the, the shows in Atlanta. All of a sudden, Ted Turner's threatening to sue him. They put a lot of pressure on Vince to sell. He sells to Jim Crockett. He sells them for like a million bucks. So he gets a million dollars from Jim Crockett and coughs up the WTBS time slot. And so Vince has a bitter rivalry with Ted Turner right after that. But for, for the purposes of this biography, the Black Saturday situation, Vince has cable TV on two different networks. And he's going into a third because now we talk about MTV. So, um... Before, Cap, MTV is sort of new. Um, it's it's something that appeals to the 18 to 25 demographic. Even at the time, they're playing a lot of rock music, music videos. Um, and then this, of course, brings Cindy Lauper. So Cindy Lauper, you know, singer from Queens. She has that New York accent, so it's perfect, right? Uh, Madison Square Garden, New York City. Cindy Lauper, huge singer from New York. Uh, they're looking to do a music video. Um, and they need somebody to play her father 
uh, in comes Captain Lou Albano. Somebody kind of knows him. They suggest him. They have to go through Vance in order to book Captain Lou Albano to do this video. So that's how they get Cindy Lauper's people get in touch with WWF. They get in touch with them through Captain Lou Albano. So uh, Captain Lou Albano and Cindy Lauper, Lauper become friends. And now things are going to pick up. Cindy Lauper's manager is David Wolf. He is a huge wrestling fan. and is really the architect behind the rock and wrestling connection. Because he, as he told in the biography, he was on the phone with Vince pretty regularly, pitching ideas and different things that involve Cindy Lauper, and she's going along with it, you know, because to him it's a natural marriage. So um, during the rock and wrestling thing, Cindy Lauper is more getting involved with the WWF, and Vince sees it as an opportunity to get it to get in bed with MTV. So that's what he does. The VJs are getting involved. Uh, Hulk Hogan is becomes a guest VJ for um, MTV. That's that's something I didn't even remember. That, and they will talk about it later, um, Hulk Hogan being the host of Saturday Night Live. I didn't remember any of that stuff. So Cindy Lauper makes her first real appearance in, on uh, an episode of Piper's Pit, where, um, I, I, don't, I think this was before Piper's Pit, now that I think of it. But um, she's doing a segment where she's sitting down with Roddy Piper and Captain Lou Albano turns heel on her. He starts talking all this misogynistic stuff about how women should stay in the kitchen, how he taught her everything that she knows, all this stuff. And she, you know, all she has to do is respond to what he's doing. So um, she sort of gets into an argument with him. She starts hitting him with her purse. She actually hit Roddy Piper with a purse, too, which is funny. <laughs> he's not important to this right now, but you'll see how he becomes important to it later. So, uh, <laughs> Cindy Lauper decides to pose a challenge to Captain Lou Albano that they were both second lady wrestlers to see who would win. Captain Lou Albano, of course, picks uh, the fabulous Mula, while Cindy Lauper picks Wendy Richter. Um, they we went into some detail about Wendy Richter, which was absolutely phenomenal. People should talk about Wendy Richter far more often. Why they don't have a battle royal or something named after Wendy Richter is pretty ridiculous. I mean, she is a central character to the rock and wrestling connection. And to be quite honest, I know some people may think, oh, you could have put any female wrestler right there. I'm not entirely sure about that. <laughs> okay. But um, she was very young. She was a, a student of Moolah's. So, you know, it, it set up everything perfectly. The young, hip you know, Wendy Richter, who was absolutely gorgeous and tanned and everything, muscled up, versus sort of the old, way past her prime, <laughs> fabulous moolah. <laughs> so that sets up to the brawl to end it all in July of 84. Your boy Mongo was all of two months at the time. <laughs> so Wendy Richter wins the WWF Women's Championship, 20,000 people in Madison Square Garden. Um, Cindy Lauper actually got involved with the match. It was the highest rated show on MTV. So now they realize that rock and wrestling works. It's working. So other people start telling the story. I think it might have been uh, Howard Finkel or maybe it had been Stephanie or somebody, Bruce. And they're asking Vince is like, okay, well, he sees that the rock and wrestling connection is working. This is where we could have used more events or use Vince in some capacity or Linda in some capacity. Um, cause they say, okay, the idea is what is wrestling's version of the Super Bowl? What is our version of the Oscars? And, uh, what could it be? And what, and you know, what should we call it? And famously Howard Finkel came up with, um, WrestleMania and he got the name from Beatlemania, which was what it was called when the Beatles came to the United States. Uh, and it was, they were extremely popular at the time. So Howard Finkel coined the term WrestleMania. And Vince, because he didn't have a lot of money, because he spent almost all of his money <laughs> uh, buying out his dad, he didn't have a lot of cash to do this whole WrestleMania thing. Thankfully, he did have uh, a couple of streams of income. As we just talked about, he got a million dollars from Jim Crockett to go away from uh, <laughs> World Championship Wrestling and at TBS. But there was another uh, influx of cash that he got. This is from uh, Tim Hornbaker's Death of the Territories. 
So Vince was in debt personally, but Titan Sports was perfect was perfectly fine. Um, they said in so one of the quotes was that the WWF spent sixteen million dollars in nineteen eighty four, but only made eleven million. But there are other uh, government documents that claim that the WWF made like thirty million. So take it or leave it. But they actually got a hefty six figure uh, drop of cash from um, New Japan Pro Wrestling as New Japan wanted to use some WWF wrestlers for um, some shows. So they got a six figure booking fee from New Japan, which helped them in the ramp up to WrestleMania, even though Vince didn't have the cash himself. So they started telling the story, you know, Stephanie started saying how Vince, you know, mortgaged everything in the house. And they decided on the road to WrestleMania, the very first one, they began to expand the rock and wrestling connection. So in this expansion, Captain Lou Albano turns babyface and uh, Roddy Piper assaults Dave Wolf, uh, Cindy Lauper and Captain Lou Albano. So he was involved with the original angle uh, and now he's back. But now he's the central part of the he's a central heel of the angle when before he was just an ancillary heel with Captain Lou Albano being sort of the central guy. So now Roddy Piper is set up to be Hulk Hogan's main enemy. Now they left this out of the biography, but it's an, it's an important piece of the biography that Roddy Piper, his gimmick going into this was that he hated rock music and he thought MTV was stupid and all this kind of stuff. And that was sort of just an angle to play into all the, all of the musicians and all these kind of people who are going to be involved with WrestleMania and be involved with MTV. So, it was great integration. You know, it was phenomenal. This leads, of course, to February 1985, a month before WrestleMania. The war to settle the score in the main event was, of course, Hulk Hogan versus Roddy Piper in a singles match. Uh, there's several musicians doing bumpers, talking about telling Roddy Piper Hulk Hogan's going to beat him up and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's fantastic. It's tremendous. Um, there's uh, Gloria Steinem, the most the famous feminist she was involved with this because remember this whole thing came from sort of misogyny as part of it. Cause Roddy Piper is also a misogynist and he doesn't like Cindy Lauper cause he kicked Cindy Lauper, <laughs> which was a trip. That's, that's still a hot angle. Every, like you can go back and watch that right now. And it's still, it's still pretty good. Like he didn't kick her in a traditional sense. Like he just sort of moved her with his foot, but you could do enough. He wasn't supposed to touch her at all in the, in the eyes of the crowd. You don't touch her at all. So what he did was great. It was like kicking a small child. It was awesome. So Mr. T was front row uh, for the war to settle the score. And of course, he's one of the most popular actors of the 80s because he's on the A-Team, which is, you know, a very popular TV show. So a wonderful thing about this that was not mentioned in the biography and probably should have. The A-Team was actually airing on NBC. Now, NBC becomes very important, especially later as uh, Dick Ebersole, and, and he doesn't pop up in this thing at all, if I don't remember correctly. Now, Saturday Night's main event, which he, of course, was you know, deeply involved with, didn't happen until after WrestleMania. I think it happened in May of 85. Um, so that would be two, a month after, two months after WrestleMania. But he's involved with events and all this kind of stuff at this point. So um, the A-Team is on NBC. They're doing business with Mr. T., Mr. T is now going to be a partner with Hulk Hogan. They did the angle where Roddy Piper takes a swing at uh, Cindy Lauper, and Mr. T, being a guy who is a, a good male feminist, jumps in the ring. You can't do that to a lady, and <laughs> and tries to protect Cindy Lauper. Uh, I love that the VJ was talking about how great uh, Mean Gene Okerlund was as a his job because he's the ringmaster for this whole or thing. And he's, you know, juggling these celebrities like Andy Warhol and Danny DeVito. And he's also dealing with the wrestlers like Roddy Piper, you know, because Roddy Piper's coming out of the shower and he's all big and sweaty and everything. He's yelling at folks. <laughs> it, was, it was great. It was great shit. Um, they, they went into a little bit of the heat uh, that Mr. T got um, at WrestleMania um, because he was, they said he, quote, rubbed people the wrong way. What they mean was that he, they were jealous at the amount of money that he was making. Um, they didn't mention the name Dr. D. David Schultz. If you don't know who that is, 
That's the guy who smacked John Stossel and claimed that Vince McMahon told him to smack John Stossel. Bullshit. He was one of these people, like Roddy Piper, who was upset that Mr. T was making so much more money than he was. And he went to fucking with Mr. T and everything, and Vince finally just got rid of him. Vince bailed him out and actually um, helped him get his license back after he got suspended for slapping John Stossel. There's a lot of stuff that went on behind the scenes, and Dr. D.A. Vichols hates Vince McMahon. So, if you actually look that whole thing up, it, it wasn't nearly what Dr. D claimed it was. And the guy was, he was uh, excitable anyway. So the idea that Vince told him to smack John Stossel was ridiculous. That put WrestleMania in jeopardy. Why would you do that? That didn't make any sense. But um, Mr. T, of course, in the documentary, he's trying to explain, you know, celebrity integration. By using me, you're know, broadening your your horizons. You're getting more people interested in what you're doing. But uh, Roddy Piper and guys like that didn't really didn't really understand that or they didn't care, which was more likely they, they didn't care. <laughs> you know, it's more likely you make too much money. You make far more money than I do. I, I don't care. Right. You're making a lot of money on this deal. I don't care. So um, they talked a little bit about closed circuit. Um, they said that WrestleMania might have been the first closed circuit show, but I don't think that's true. The to be, to be quite honest, I think that there was another closed circuit. Well, it's not the first one. It might be the first closed circuit wrestling show. Let's put it like that. Let's insert the word wrestling. Because they did discuss where Vince got the idea from. Because uh, Vince did business with Evil Knievel. Uh, Evil Knievel was going to do a stunt. This guy was the most famous stuntman in, in the country. Uh, he, Him and Vince you know, lost a ton of money on a closed circuit deal in like the, what was it, the late 70s or something like that. It was a, It was a whole stupid thing. But Vince learned, you know, you learn from your failures. He learned about closed circuit working with Evil Knievel. So he decided to double down and he was going to run WrestleMania closed circuit because, hey, why sell out one building when you can be able to sell out multiple buildings? So, so according to Tim Hornbaker's National Wrestling Alliance book, Vince McMahon licensed 200 closed circuit locations across the country. And the closed circuit, how it works, is basically like a movie theater that has the ability to to tap into the pay-per-view thing. So you can go there and basically watch WrestleMania in a theater with a bunch of other people. And they, they kind of made a joke out of it in the biography thing. Like, why would you want to do that? It's like, it's, it's a movie. <laughs> you know, it's like essentially a movie. You go watch movies with other people that you don't know. So why wouldn't you go watch, you know, a wrestling show with a bunch of people that you don't know? They still do it today, as a matter of fact. I think some, very few wrestling shows do it, but some do. It's the same as going to the movies. Um, I saw that ticket prices for these shows were on average about 15 bucks. So if it was 1985 and you wanted to go see WrestleMania in, you know, but, but hump Alabama, then, you know, you go to your local theater or whatever, pay 15 bucks, get you a seat and you would watch WrestleMania on the big screen. You know, it probably sold popcorn and all that kind of other stuff, too. So that was great. It was a, it was a pretty good deal. Um, so from there, we they showed a little bit of footage I've never seen before. This was uh, Vince coaching Mr. T and Hulk Hogan through a promo when they were out on the streets doing public workouts. Uh, <laughs> that was pretty cool. They also showed Hulk Hogan going to the Grammys, which I didn't know even happened. He went to the Grammys with Cindy Lauper. And this is when Cindy Lauper famously threatened Roddy Piper at the Grammys. That was that was awesome. That was awesome. Uh, Hulk Hogan and Mr. T are doing public workouts talking about we beating up thugs. <laughs> and they host on Saturday Night Live. He talked a little bit about uh, Master Square Garden, the importance of the building. Um, couldn't be anywhere else, you know, absolutely. So this was that the, the idea of WrestleMania, of course, is it's the Super Bowl of wrestling. And one of the fans in the biography, I'd never seen this guy before in my life, said the Super Bowl is super boring. This is the new thing. WrestleMania. And I'm like, man, that fucking guy, he should, his face should be everywhere. The Super Bowl is super boring. <laughs> that rules. Um, so they tell the story of WrestleMania, Ricky Steamboat. This is where we started seeing a lot of the wrestlers that were there. Ricky Steamboat is there. He talks about going to say hi to Muhammad Ali and how cool it was. 
Stephanie was in the building, but she was, you know, a, a kid at the time. And she just talked about how it was a different energy from all the other wrestling shows. But, you know, I'm pretty sure she couldn't put it together. She'd have been 10 or something like that, probably nine or something like that at the point at this point in time. Um, so they go through the card and they talk about each wrestler. Ricky Steamboat talks about getting a, a wrestling match at WrestleMania. He wrestled Matt Bourne, by the way. Matt Bourne, who was accused of statutory rape. He was also a doink the clown. So he was the first doink. He was doink number one. The good one. Jimmy Hart, who uh, manages to make his way into every WWE production somehow, somewhere. I think if he's going to end up being like the Stan Lee of WWF, where it's not going to be Vince. It's going to be goddamn Jimmy Hart. He's going to find his way to pop up in everything. Um, they talked about he was on WrestleMania twice because he was on there for King Kong Bundy's match. He was also on there for Great Hammer Valentine's match. Um, Bray Wyatt's daddy and his uncle were on this ma- was, on, was on this show. His daddy, Mike Rotundo, aka IRS, and his uncle Barry Wyndham, they both wrestled. They wrestled uh, the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov, I think, for the tag team titles, if I remember correctly. Uh, Big John Studd and Andre the Giant. They had a body slam challenge. Uh, Wendy Richter with uh, Cindy Lauper wrestled Leilani Kai for the women's championship. Uh, Wendy Richter said this was the highlight of her life. She was only like 22 or 23 at the time. And she wouldn't be around for WWF much longer after this. That's when she got her to her financial tiff with Vince. And she wanted more money than Vince was willing to pay. Which led to the what they call the original screw job, Which is when Moolah shoot pinned uh, Wendy Richter. That would come much later. But this was, this was all good days. When everybody was on good terms. And obviously, uh, Hulk Hogan and Mr. T versus Roddy Piper and Paul Orndorff was the main event. This is where they had uh, the Rockets and Liberace and Muhammad Ali. (laughs) Piper believing that Mr. T was going to double cross him for some odd reason. I don't know why he thought that. I forgot Jimmy Snooker was in their corner because um, Randy Orton's daddy, Bob Orton Jr., was in the corner of... um, Piper and Orndorff, so it's kind of like a three on three, you know. But each one had a guy outside the ring. And Jamie Snuka, despite the fact this is is this before the I think this is, is I think this is after the Nancy Argentino situation. This is two years after uh, Nancy Argentino, where uh, Jamie Snuka allegedly, in big bold letters, allegedly killed Nancy Argentino. He most certainly did beat her. But uh, did he kill her later? We, we don't know. We don't know. But he was he was there for the first WrestleMania. That's a rough one to live down. Um, now, as far as referees are concerned, Muhammad Ali was supposed to be the referee. But then they did this whole angle where he was taking swings at guys, like taking a swing at Piper and stuff like that. It was real fun. So they swapped him out for Pat Patterson. So Pat Patterson got to be the referee in the main event of the first WrestleMania. Um Hulk Hogan, of course, tells this, this story about how every time he saw Muhammad Ali after this, Muhammad Ali put his arm around him and said, you're the greatest of all time. You're the greatest of all time. I don't know if I believe that. He's also wearing a Macho Man shirt in this in this biography. I'm like, that shirt is going to come to life and strangle you. <laughs> you know, like, like, brother, I don't even want your, like, I don't want my likeness on your chest. I don't like that. Uh, <laughs> they allegedly had um, one million fans on closed circuit throughout the country. Huge financial windfall. Hulk Hogan becomes a household name. They start telling this story. It would have been a nice story for you know Vince to tell, but um, this is told third hand. So somebody, I don't remember who. I didn't write down. Um, Linda. So, uh, you know, said Shane was playing with G.I. Joe's in the back seat of the car. And Vince said to Linda, one day he's going to, their children are going to play with WWF action figures. So after WrestleMania is a huge success, WWF starts kicking into their merchandising, which is a very important piece of WWF business. Because there was a WrestleMania game in 1989. So like five years later. But they started the production of action figures, T-shirts, everything almost immediately. And uh, <clears throat> they are, it, I mean, there was already some light uh, merchandising, but now the machine is is rolling because everybody wants to be in the WWF business. Um, at the same time, there's the rock and wrestling cartoon. There is all sorts of stuff that happens after the first WrestleMania. 
And then at the end of the biography, you learn that Vince McMahon was 38 years old when he when he had the first WrestleMania. And he had only owned had full ownership of the company for about 18 months. He 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 took over the company fully in June of 83. So in June of 83, he began you know the full takeover that's when he began going national and late in late 84 early 85 he started doing rock and wrestling and in 85 he did wrestlemania so he he got it moving real fast you know once he got control you started seeing what was happening he put his man in place that would be hulk hogan he got his team in place he hooked up with dick ebersall and and david wolf all this stuff happened in like 18 months like it sounds like, you know, it was like he strapped a rocket to himself. He had his own major mega push. And it was all based off vision and guts and, you know, some version of betting on yourself. So that was the story of WrestleMania 1. Um, there's obviously more to it, but this biography was one of the best ones. This one was very good. Of course, it needed more events and more Linda, people who were more hands-on with it. Bruce Pritchard was not there. Stephanie was a child. Triple H was a child. You know, like, <laughs> like uh, it could have used maybe some more historians. And, you know, the VJs, I think that was a nice touch. Um, David Wolf still being alive was a nice touch. Cindy Lauper still being there was a nice touch. You know, it could have used, used probably a little bit more. But the wrestlers, you know, we've heard the wrestlers talk about WrestleMania 1 a lot. But we haven't heard a lot about, the, you know, the ancillary characters talk about WrestleMania 1 a lot. So this was very good. What did you guys think of the A&E biography on WrestleMania 1? Again, I think it was one of the better ones. I think this season was very good. Lex Luger, awesome. Rey Mysterio, WrestleMania, all tremendous. On par with WrestleMania with, um, Season 1, in, in my opinion. But uh, let me know what you guys think. Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later.